Okay. Well, thanks everyone for joining. And I'll um, I'll probably use the 45 minutes because there's a lot of content, but I um, definitely feel um, I'll try and get it all in on time because I know everyone in Europe must be must be getting late there already. So as I mentioned, uh, Mike Schwartz, I'm the founder of a company called Glue. We have an op a free open source distribution for identity management, and uh, I should say identity and access management. Uh, it's called the Glue Server. You can probably just Google Glue Server and it'll come right up. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, I'm the author of a book called Securing the Perimeter that was published by APRIS um, in the end of 2018. And this is a good intro if you want to learn about federated identity, OpenID, SAML, LDAP, uh, two-factor authentication. There's a whole chapter in there. Um, the book is a good reference. Uh, the, each chapter of the book is about 30 pages. Half of that is theory, and half of that is examples of how you can try this stuff out with, op with free open source libraries and tools. I'm also the host of a podcast called Open Source Underdogs. And you can find that on opensourceunderdogs.com. It's also on Stitcher and iTunes and Google Podcasts and pretty much every podcast plat platform, SoundCloud. And this is a, a podcast. It's more of a business podcast than a tech podcast, but I interview the founders of open source companies and we talk about um, the business model uh, holistically, not just how you make money, but um, how you interact with customers and and what's the value prop and and it's been really interesting for me to do it so i encourage you if you're interested in building an open source business or i should say if you're crazy enough to think about endeavoring to do that listen to the podcast there's a lot of good advice it'll probably save you five years um, of time um, but today's topic um, is two-factor authentication um, you might remember this guy who was i think the first president to really ever mention this topic. He encouraged uh, Americans to use something better than passwords. So, uh, so, uh, um, but two-factor authentication, you know, it's been a government um, sort of initiative and, and best practice for a long time. So those of you who might know the standard called 863, these are guidelines, the first guidelines that really define what is two-factor authentication and it's become sort of um, sort of famous to people think about it as something you know, something you have, something you are. So in order for, for an authentication technology to be two-factor, you must have two of those. So for example, you can't have two something you have, like you can't have two tokens. It has to be a combination of these two. Um, and, you know, passwords are much maligned. Everyone hates passwords. But maybe in the interest of being a little bit contrarian, I would say, let's actually maybe not give up on passwords because maybe it's not the passwords that are the problem, but maybe it's overuse of one form of authentication that's the problem. And sort of like uh, any monoculture becomes susceptible. And, and so maybe passwords are a monoculture. And, and so, and that's part of the problem. But cognitive mechanisms, you know, something you know, it's still a handy trick. And I don't know if we're ready to give that one up yet. So one of the interesting things to think about is the threat for any authentication technology is the threat model. Um, one of my friends said, how do you make a two-factor two authentication vendor cry? Ask him for the threat model. Uh, of their technology, because every technology is susceptible to different types of attack. And if we just think about the threat model for passwords, there's a, there's actually is a pretty massive threat model of like, and this is only a partial list of the ways that passwords can get you know compromised. But you can have key loggers, you, you have passwords that are cracked and available for sale on the, on you know the dark web. You have um, um, bad passwords um, and the hackers can trick people to give you into giving them their password. So they can present a page that looks like a login page and you might think it's a login page, but it's actually the hackers page. Um, there's cross-site scripting. So the, the, really we could go on and on probably for about an hour about the different ways you can defeat passwords. So, um, so it is um, um, bad. So in the next couple of slides, before I d d dive more into the how-to, 
I want to talk about some different types of authentication because a lot of people I tend to, they ask me like, you know, what's the solution? And some people think, well, the solution is biometric or the solution is my mobile phone or the solution is, you know, whatever. Um, my my guess is that every, every type of um, authentication has trade-offs um, and there is no, no perfect um, authentication mechanism. But um, biometrics, let's start there. Um, the convenience factor is amazing. Like you always are, you can't forget your biometrics. Um, but there's sort of a tra trade off between sensitivity and usability. So I could make it really sensitive, um, but then I get a lot of, you know, um, um, failures when I'm trying to authenticate. Or I could make it not sensitive at all, um, and then my cat can authenticate, you know, can instead of me. Um, but it works every time. So there's always this trade-off in biometrics that I think is worth considering of like the of the accuracy versus the usability. Um, and there's a lot of different types of biometrics. So basically, every part of the human um, body is unique. Um, you know, if you could, you so you could probably have like ear authentication if you put your phone to your ear. You know, and even within a um, a modality like fingerprint. There's, there's a lot of different sensors that look at fingerprints differently. Um, we also have behavioral biometrics, like how do you type um, or how do you move the mouse? Um, and we have what's called multimodal, or maybe we're looking at a couple of different biometrics. So there are ways to improve biometric security by combining factors. Um, somebody commented that you can't verify that biometrics are, um, you're actually volunteering your biometrics. Yeah, and, and this, so sometimes biometrics um, might um, fall into the category of what I call fraud detection, where you maybe you're talking to your bank on the phone and they're using voice biometrics in the background to authenticate you. And, but sometimes there's a fine line between, is that authentication where you're actively proving your identity or is it fraud detection? Um, behavioral biometrics, I think, uh, frequently fall into the category of, of fraud detection. Um, also, this is this is industry jargon, but some people forget that there's a difference between identification and authentication. So if you're walking by a camera um, in an airport and it identifies you, you know, let's say I walk by and it says, oh, that's Mike Schwartz. That's identification, that's not authentication. Authentication is when I'm actively asserting I am Mike Schwartz and I have something to prove it, here's my face. Um, but um, this is splitting, splitting hairs a little bit. Um, but you know, with that said, I, you know, biometrics are interesting um, and some of them are accurate and some of them um, are very convenient. Um, so they're, they're a part of the, um, of the solution. Um, now, a lot of you might remember these older types of like numbers, like you might have had a key fob or, or Google Authenticator is good because it's on your phone. And um, these are actually, this is based on an open standard called OATH. Um, there's two ways that these algorithms are generated, um, TOTP, which is based on time, HOTP, um, which is actually based on a counter. If you want to read the real detail about how these numbers are generated, chapter seven of my book, um, it goes into like for a lot of detail about it. It's actually pretty clever, um, but they're still useful um, because um, the nice thing about these numbers is, is that the, the bar for the input device is pretty low. Um, I can use DTMF, you know, the numbers on your phone to enter a, an OTP. Um, and uh, I can even read an OTP securely to an agent. You should never read your password to an agent over the phone. Uh, but an OTP I could safely read because it's only good for a cup for, a, you know, I don't know, 30 seconds or so. So it's, um, it, it, it's, this is still, it might be old, but it's still a handy um, trick for authentication. And, and this is a something you have. You have possession of a phone that has this um, counter in it, or you have possession of a physical device that's generating the OTP. Um, I mentioned hardware OTP. Um, so these things have come way down in price. They used to be like $50 a token. Now you can get them for like a dollar or two a token. So uh, as I mentioned, you know, they're still around. People think they're gone, but they're still still with us. Um, SMS OTP. Um, so 
if you, um, I'm sure everyone has done this at this point where you get a code through your, S by providing your SMS number and um, and you put that code in and that's, that's proof of control of a phone number. Um, the, um, one of the challenges with that is that you're basically trusting the mobile operator. Um, so it's not a great proof of identity um, and, and mobile operators can be tricked. So if, uh, if you go into like a T-Mobile, like and I don't mean to pick on T-Mobile, really any mobile operator, like um, retail outlet, and you say, you know, I'm Donald Trump um, and they look at you and they say, okay. And they, um, and you say, well, I lost my phone, give me a new phone. And they hand you a new phone and they port the number. So the, what you're relying on is the mobile operator to, to vet the, the identity of that person. And they don't always necessarily do such a good job there. So um, in fact, the telco operators have been tricked over the phone to switch um, the routing of a phone number to another uh, SIM card. So, um, so there's a number of mobile push um, applications out there. This is a screenshot of Superglue. Um, that's that's uh, my company's free app, um, um, but you might have used Duo Security, uh, Microsoft and Google have mobile authenticators. Um, these are um, using um, a mobile app that receives the push notification and um, generally gives you more information than a um, um, than your you know SMS OTP about the context. And also, um, there's normally some type of cryptographic proof of of, of um, possession type of algorithm where it's not just a push notification, but also um, showing some uh, type of, um, let's say, previously generated key or possession of a previously generated key pair. So, um, and um, you, also, yeah, they might show geolocation. So there's uh, some other things you can do because the mobile phone is is pretty pretty um, impressive sensor and has a lot of data. Um, one of the um, interesting, um, let's say, properties of an authentication technology is whether it's phishing resistant. So one of the ways that um, um, two-factor authentications are vulnerable to attack is if um, you start with a phishing email that says, click on this link, the person clicks on the link, and then they're directed to a login page that looks authentic, and somehow they provide their password. And in this case, the, the, I think I have another slide here. Yeah, this is the slide I really want. So, so the, the hack starts with a go click on this link. And by the way, this, this is a sort of a diagram from a real attack um, that, that took place. So the, 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 actually the attack started with, um, with the DNS getting hacked at a bank. And the, and the, and the hacker added an entry like login56.bank.com. Um, and they obtained an SSL certificate for that link. And so, and then they sent out a phishing email that looked pretty authentic. Um, and, you know, so customers got it and they saw the link and the link was like, okay, well, it's, this isn't a, a host that I recommend, I, I recognize, but it is a, it is a, at the bank. So I guess it's okay. So they click on it and it presents the bank's website. And it looks exactly right. So you're, you're not noticing anything different. And of course, the hacker is just proxying the website to the actual, to the real bank website. And the person enters their username and password, fine. They get sent an OTP and they think, well, I am you know, logging into the bank. So they enter the OTP, that gets proxied. Now they have a session. So this attack um, is really, really effective. Um, there have been a number of examples of targeted attacks that this has worked for, um, against people. Um, so it, it's very effective. Um, and um, so the, the, the trick here is that the SSL connection made between the user and the hacker and the SSL connection made between the hacker and the bank set are different. So this is how you detect if a man in the middle attack is happening. So uh, technologies that can verify um, direct connectivity or that can't be proxied where the, where the browser must connect directly to the bank for them to work are gonna be better. Um, and let's see, so FIDO is one of these phishing resistant credentials because FIDO requires a plugin in the browser and the, and the interaction is between the browser and the FIDO endpoint at the bank. Um, 
the um, uh, the a man in the middle cannot proxy fight a FIDO authentication. So this is one of the many reasons why FIDO is really really good. Um, and um, and I'll just maybe point out that although the tokens are excellent and there's Bluetooth tokens, we're seeing FIDO built into a lot of hardware. So for example, I have a Google Pixel Book and that has FIDO built in. Um, but we're just seeing FIDO being built into more and more hardware so that you maybe don't even need to, to plug in some extra piece of hardware like a, a, a USB key. Um, FIDO 2 is interesting because it combines, instead of pressing the button, um, you could actually use a biometric. So Windows Hello, where, you, where it's using voice authentication, or in this in this uh, Fition um, FIDO token, instead of pressing the button, you use your fingerprint. Um, it's a little geeky today, though, like how you register the fingerprint. So I think this technology still has some way to go. But you could see if this is built into your phone, which already has a biometric sensor, how something like this um, com combination of uh, FIDO um, plus biometric uh, is, is really, really powerful. Um, smart cards. Um, so this is where you have a card with a cryptographic chip. Um, this also prevents phishing um, because the, the, the smart card connects to the browser, uses mutual TLS. Um, so very secure. That's why government still uses it. That's why military still uses it. It was really the original phishing resistant credential. Um, the main issue with, with um, smart cards is they're expensive and it's hard to plug a smart card into your phone. And, um, and um, you know, they've tried to build smart cards into phones, but every solution they've come up with has been relatively expensive to implement. So, uh, but they're not going away. And, and in some ways they're getting expanded because um, your bank card is a smart card. And, um, and, and so there's still innovation in, in this idea that we have a chip with a, um, sort of embedded um, protected key. So, um, okay, so that was a long time talking about different types of authentication. Um, the, the point that I like to make about it is that there's sort of a trade-off. You know, when you're looking at authentication technologies, think about security, usability, and deployability. So there's, that's really where the trade-off involves. So, um, and deployability, in my opinion, has been the main barrier for adoption of, of two-factor authentication in general. So we've had, to, it's not hard to say that anything is more secure than passwords. You know, passwords are terrible for security. Um, and in terms of usability, I don't know if you've ever put your password in on your TV remote, but I don't think there's a worse user experience than that. Um, so there's definitely, you know, clicking a button or inserting a USB token um, is, could have way better usability. So if it's if we've established that security is bad for passwords and usability is not great, then I I think it should by process of elimination there must be something about deployability that's preventing mass adoption of passwords. And as somebody who's sort of in the industry, um, you'd be surprised. You know, you I see 2FA becoming more mainstream. I'm seeing articles in like in general interest newspapers about two-factor authentication, like my local paper maybe covering why you should use uh, two-factor. Um, but still the, there's a wide swath of like of government uh, and commercial and um, uh, work um, um, websites and, and other um, digital, digital assets that are still using passwords alone. So, um, so uh, Microsoft did an interesting research study. This is too, this is too um, small to read. Um, I'll just read you basically the, um, the, the 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 summary. So, and their research um, actually showed that um, while um, some I'm trying to get back to my ah, can't find it. Up oh, there we are. Um, so so while some types of authentication are more usable um, and some are more secure. No, no, mech, no um, authentication technology is more deployable, and they say marginal gains aren't sufficient. Um, so, um, this Microsoft study was sort of a, a study of studies. So they looked at all these different um, types of authentication and rated them on usability, deployability, security, and uh, and I thought it was an interesting uh, conclusion. Um, so how do we how do we meet this um, this deployability challenge? And that's what I want to talk about um, today. Um, and so, um, okay, 
maybe a little bit more background. I, I think we've seen a lot of advances in, uh, in authentication. Uh, Google, I think, has done a really great job. Um, you know, Google has probably rolled out, was one of the first to roll out, like, a, you know, one of the largest authentication, you know, strong authentication um, programs. Um, so they, they have a lot of great data on usability and on um, user experience and, and security. So one of the things you'll find Google was probably an early adopter of was multi-step authentication. So instead of trying to have more than one factor on one page, actually um, present the user through a number of pages. Um, so in, in step one, they ask for your username. They don't even ask for your password. In step two, they ask for your password. And in step three, they ask for your token or some other authenticator. So this idea that we're gonna put the user in, in the old days, we might see something like RSA tokens where you put in your username and then you put in the pin number plus the um, plus the token on the on the on the or plus the number on the token. So it was two two factor because it was the pin is something you know, the 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 OTP is something you have, um, but it was done as one step. And what we're seeing today is that we're moving to multi-step authentication workflows instead of single step. Um, so one of the um, key um, issues for deployability is, is recovery. So what happens when you lose that credential? I think this is actually the single biggest deployment challenge for organizations. So um, if the answer to you lose your token is you have to call the help desk, um, then um, that's a problem because the help desk is probably going to be less secure at authenticating you over the phone than the um, than your authentication credential was. Um, ideally, if you lose your strong credential, you should have to present yourself in person, and you should get re-identity proofed. So they should look at your ID. They should look at you, and they say, just like when you first got the credential. So the in order to do credential recovery well you need two equally strong credentials. So if you're gonna issue FIDO tokens or if you're gonna use a FIDO token, get two FIDO tokens. And I show this, um, this picture, um, this is per, uh, Perugino Fresco from um, the Sistine Chapel. And you know here it's Peter getting the keys to heaven and note he's getting two keys because um, even Peter can't be trusted not to lose one of the keys. So he's getting a backup key. So if Peter needs two keys then, then you need two keys. If you don't have two equally strong keys, then you, you end up degrading. You're only as strong as your weakest backup um, credential. So if you have a really strong, let's say token, and you have a backup as SMS, don't bother with the token. You're only, you know, there's no point to it. You're only as strong as SMS. Um, so Google um, actually, uh, I really like uh, the way that they handle it um, because they have one page where they let you um, um, it enroll several credentials. So this is a picture of my Google 2FA page. And you can see, I mentioned the Pixel books actually can be registered as a token. Um, the HyperFido Mini, I have, a, I have a YubiKey, I have a couple of tokens. Um, I use Google Authenticator app. Um, but I like, uh, I really like what Google is doing here. They're sort of giving me one page where I can see my strong credentials. And if I lose one, I can delete it. Um, or if I get a new one, I, I can enroll it. Um, and so I'll do a, a demo later. Uh, Glue has an open source tool uh, called Casa, um, which provides um, that type of functionality. I'm actually gonna do a demo of Casa. Um, okay, and we're in the demo part. Um, so, okay, um, we're still into the demo part, so let's go. Um, so first of all, um, let's just talk a little bit about the Glue server and OpenID Connect. So um, another way that we can address the deployability challenge is by um, making sure that we have a loose bundling between the authentication technologies and the applications. So just to make an extreme example, if you have 100 applications and you, um, let's say you have um, OTP tokens, um, and you have um, passwords. 
and you decide you want to introduce FIDO tokens. Um, well, if you're if you're if you're actually hard coding the authentication logic in the applications, then you have to go to 100 applications in order to introduce um, FIDO tokens, and that's a lot of work. So, so the best practice, and this has been for a lot of years, for 20 years or so, has been uh, when you have a lot of applications, is to implement some type of centralized authentication um, platform. You know, in the old days, we had web access management platforms. Um, you know, now there's really been a trend to move to open standards. So SAML is the most well-known of the older open standards. You know, it's an XML-based um, federated identity um, protocol. OpenID Connect is, is like a JSON REST SAML, where, where um, the, the idea is, is that the application redirects to the IDP. You know, this is the same in SAML and OpenID Connect. So instead of having the login page live on the, on the, in the application, the application redirects to the central OpenID provider, which, which presents uh, one or more login pages. Um, so, you know, just to give you a real world example here, um, if I go to Gmail in uh, incognito mode, so I'm not logged in, I get redirected to accounts.google.org. This is the Google IDP. Um, then I'll log in and I'll get redirected back to Gmail. Um, this is the pattern that is basically um, every, every single sign-on technology ever invented uses the redirect. And if you can think of one that doesn't use redirects, please invent it because uh, we everyone wants that. Um, no one's figured out how to do it. Um, so in OpenID Connect, we have this thing called the authentication request. And where I'm going with this is that um, in the authentication request, the application has an opportunity to signal to the identity provider what type of authentication is desired. Um, and the parameter that we recommend to use at Glue is called ACR values. Um, so, you know, OpenID Connect has a lot of parameters, but basically you could say, um, and ACR values equals OTP, or and ACR values equals FIDO. So it, it provides a hint to the IDP about the type of authentication that you want. Um, but by using open standards and, and op, um, uh, for SSO, um, you can really um, manage your authentication business logic in one place. Um, and the other nice thing about open standards is that um, the reason why our, um, the industry has gone this way is because there can be no top-down solution for security. Um, modern organizations have a mix of custom applications, um, um, off-the-shelf applications, and SaaS applications. And by, by supporting open standards, um, um, then um, there's no way a SaaS provider, for example, like Salesforce, is going to support your proprietary SSO protocol. But you know, because thousands or millions of organizations are supporting SAML, it makes sense for them to support that. And that's why we've seen this real move in the industry towards open standards for identity. And it's really important for driving down the deployment cost for two-factor authentication. Um, Okay, so here's the, the quick, uh, so how do I get one of these open ID providers? Um, well, you could use a SaaS service like Okta or OneLogin, um, but if you're open source oriented and you wanna run your own open ID provider, um, the Glue server is not a bad way to start. Um, there's Kubernetes, there's Docker. I'm just gonna show the Linux um, installation just to give you an idea of like how easy this is. To install Glue, you add our repository, um, you add our signing key for the packages, you do an update, you do apt install glue server. So that's sort of step one. Step one is apt install glue server. Um, step two is you start the glue server service, not surprising, has to be running. Um, you log into the container. Glue, is, um, glue server runs as a true root container. So you'll hear us say, are you in the container? Um, basically, after you start the container, log into the container. And then you run setup, and you, you setup will ask you about 15 different questions like what's your IP address, what's your host name, what's your city, state, email. When it generates a self-signed certificate, there's a whole bunch of questions, and then it'll say what components you want to install, um, and um, there's four required components: um, HTTPD, um, LDAP, which is our database, 
um, OxAuth, which is the OpenID provider, and OxTrust, which is the admin um, UI. So if you want to just do the basic, most basic installation, just say yes to those four things. Um, if you have a little bit of extra memory, and Glue Server requires about four gigs, but if you have a little bit more memory, then just say yes and install everything. Um, but just to give you an idea, it doesn't like installing glue. Um, glue it's just re it's really not that hard. Um, and then after you do the installation, basically um, you'll be able to log into the the um, glue admin console, and it looks like this. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about how glue implements these different types of authentication. Um, so. The, the best thing and the worst thing about Glue, uh, this, and this, you can see it says not secure. That's because my server is, this is running in a local VM. Um, I'm using um, I'm a Linux geek, I'm running Ubuntu, and so I'm running Virtual Machine Manager. Anyway, this isn't a real server, it's just running on my, on my VM locally. Um, so anyway, but I did a basic installation on the VM and um, anyway, the best thing and the worst thing about Glue is we have these things called interception scripts. And these interception scripts allow you to um, customize the behavior of the Glue server. And um, so if you're just doing password authentication, um, you can um, store passwords in the Glue LDAP server, or you could point the Glue server at, let's say maybe you have an existing Active Directory server with passwords in it. So if you're just doing password authentication, you don't have to do any programming at all. Um, you can just you know, point it at LDAP. Um, but if you wanna implement two-factor authentication, um, you have to implement, write one of these, we call them auth person authentication scripts. We ship out of the box with a whole bunch of these. So we ship with certificate, that's smart card, OTP, um, that's HTTP and TOTP. Um, we, uh, SMPP is a, a, like for sending uh, SMS messages, um, Duo security, commercial s service, um, SMS using Twilio API, uh, FIDO U2F, FIDO2, Superglues or mobile app. So we're giving you a whole bunch of these out of the box. There's actually even more of them um, in GitHub um, for our project um, under OxAuth server integrations, we publish a whole bunch more scripts. Um, so there's some more third-party commercial vendors in here. Um, there's some more weird workflows. And um, anyway, there's a bunch of examples you can look at. Um, and um, today I wanted to show you, um, just as a quick example, Duo Security. Um, some of you might be familiar with this. It's, it was bought by Cisco. Um, they have a mobile app. Um, they also allow you, you to use um, SMS or voice. Um, but um, let me go actually. Um, and um, I, you know, in the script, actually I'll show you in the, in the interface. So, um, so I mentioned before the ACR values. So in the glue server, the name of the script is the ACR value. So if you want to use Duo authentication, you would redirect the user to the Glue server using an OpenID Connect authentication request, and you would say ACR values equals Duo. And, and so the ACR corresponds to the name of the script. Um, we have properties in the script. You know, these are, you can add any number of properties. Um, and, um, and then you can paste your script in here um, you can also, um, you can store the script in the database or the file system. When you're doing development, you can use the file system in GitHub, for example. Um, when, if you're in a cluster, we prefer to store these scripts in, a, in the database um, because that way um, the scripts are available to all the servers if you make an update. Um, and uh, let me show you one of these scripts. So the scripts are written in Jython. Um, so that's the Java version of Python. Um, which is kind of interesting because you can use either uh, Java um, or Python classes, as long as these are pure Python um, classes. Um, but um, um, I think that's kind of neat. You know, for example, we had a Java class to send email. We just imported that. Um, um, in the Glue server, there's a lot of different types of, of uh, interception scripts um, for issuing tokens, and uh, doing lots of different types of things. So each, each of these scripts has a different interface or methods that you need to implement. 
Um, so this determines what type of script it is. Um, so not surprisingly, the most interesting method is called authenticate. And this is going to return true or false. Um, note, we send in the step. Um, so in a cluster of glue servers, remember, you might have a multi-step authentication. And maybe, let's say we have 100 glue servers. And maybe glue server you know, 30 presents step number one. And glue set number 56 presents um, step number two. So the way that we handle this is that the step is sent into the authenticate method. And then uh, in the method, we basically switch on the step. We say, if step one, do something. Um, if step two, you know, do something else. Um, I like to show this script because it's sort of interesting. So in step one of Duo, we actually just use the password as step one. So we, we validate the credentials. In this case, the, we're validating against the local um, password in, the, in our local um, LDAP server. Um, but um, I like this script because it gives an example of, um, of how to do what we call adaptive authentication. So um, in um, what we do is this customer, they wanted to um, try out Duo. So first they, um, um, they created a group and they said, if you're in the Duo group, we're gonna give you a two-step authentication. If you're not in the Duo group, we're gonna let you through on a one-step authentication. Um, so um, this way, the IT department wanted to try out Duo before they rolled it out to the whole company. And this was sort of a simple solution. But it shows you how you can change the number of steps based on the context. And so um, you can use this strategy also for things like, OK, if it's in you know, the country that you're in, um, you know, do one step. If it's outside your country, do two steps. Um, or you could even call, there's fraud scores. Um, you know, there's a good one. New Star has a service called what's it called? New Star IP Reputation. Um, so just based on the IP address, you can get a risk score. Um, um, so you can do some strategies like this and say, you know, if the um, um, if the uh, risk score is greater than something, use a different uh, based on the IP address. Use use uh, add an extra step. Um, we also see cases where um, companies say, um, I've detected that your, um, you know, that your account has been um, compromised on a different website. Um, you know, um, I'm going to send you an SMS to make sure it's really you. So you have quite a bit of flexibility to sort of adapt to the context of the of this of the um, transaction and add more steps. Michael, we're coming up on five minutes. Okay, thank you for the warning. I was totally wondering about that. I forgot to look at the clock. Um, let me show two more things. Um, so um, count authentication steps, get page for steps. So, that, so you can actually create a custom page. So in the glue server, you can customize the look and feel of like page one or page two. So let me finish the demo by showing um, this application called Casa. So I showed you before how Google lets you um, you know, manage your different types of authentication. This, this CASA is a free open source um, portal, self-service portal that's built into the Glue server. Um, and so I'll give a quick two-factor demo here. Um, so let me enter my password. So the password is step one. And you can see we support social login. Um, so now it's asking me to click the, um, my, my token. I have a FIDO token. And I'm going to actually cancel this. I'm going to try and sign in another way. And I'll use bio ID authentication. Um, this is bio, biometric um, using facial recognition. So, oh, OK. I think it's messed up because my camera's in use. OK, that would have been a cool demo. I'm going to have to do something else. Yeah, Let's do I super think glue. You're using it on Zoom, so it's not going to let you access it. Exactly. Yeah, so I'll do super glue instead. Um, read, actually, we have a blog about bio ID on our website. It used the webcam to do facial recognition. All right, so I'm getting um, a notification, super glue notification. Um, it's asking me for my fingerprint, give it my fingerprint. It's saying, um, you know, Mike is logging in from Austin, I'll approve. And it should log me in. Um, so anyway, it, this sort of tells you how like you can implement a couple of different types of authentication. 
Um, so like Google, we let you enroll multiple uh, FIDO keys. I have a couple of Yubi keys. Um, 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 we actually are shipping this um, um, uh, bio, bio um, ID plugin now. Um, that's a SaaS service, but um, it's kind of cool. Um, super glue. So if I have, if I get a new phone, um, I can enroll a phone. Um, and um, if I lose a phone, I can delete it. Um, this is the SMS with with Twilio, um, OTP. Um, for example, I have two phones registered, but if I lose my phone, um, I can scan the QR code, uh, use Google Authenticator or Sophos Authenticator or something, enroll my phone. Um, but um, but I think that um, so um, we felt that this was sort of missing um, um, in the in the. By the way, uh, maybe I'll just show you guys are maybe some geeks out there. Um, you want to you have your own cool type of two-factor authentication. Um, Casa has plugins, so if you want to add a different type of um, plugin, maybe some other type of authentication we didn't think of, you can write a plugin. Um, basically, as long as there's an API to list credentials and add remove credential, then you can uh, build a plugin for Casa um, yourself and add it and and submit it to our GitHub, and we'd be happy to publish it. Um, but um, yeah, but I felt like this was missing. Like there's a lot of websites out there that allow you to do self-service password reset, but no way to do um, um, reset on um, on your stronger credentials. And yeah, so I, maybe we have a minute or two. I know this was going to be tight, so I didn't leave a ton of room for questions. But I, I guess maybe we have a minute for one or two. Mike, have you got a final slide that you can show people your contact information? Sure. Yeah, let me go back to that. Yep, that's me. Um, we're Glue Federation. Um, Look for an announcement next week um, um, at the Linux Foundation. We have some exciting news. I can't say exactly what yet, but um, next week we'll be um, announcing something with Linux Foundation. Um, Glue Federation's our Twitter handle. Um, send me a LinkedIn. I'm NYNY Mike. Um, and um, and um, yeah, question is, do you have something for 2FA SSH? Um, so actually, Glue is a Radius server built in, and so you could use PAM Radius, and then we have a plugin um, for our, our Radius uh, server that it would allow you to send the notification to Superglue. So there is a way to do it for SSH. Um, another um, a recommendation I have for SSH is to look at a tool from Gravitational called Teleport. That's a really, really good, like way better than what we're doing type of solution that's open source. Um, and uh, it's based on, um, it's like a better usage of SS SSH keys by themselves aren't necessarily secure. Um, so Teleport uses um, X509 certificates. Um, of course, certificates carry extra data besides the cryptographic key. And, um, and so Teleport is really, really good, highly recommended for SSH. 